Okay, so uh, just to tell you a bit about myself, I'm uh, 28 years old. I come from a small town in the south of England, just south of London, and I've been living here for about seven years now. Uh, I first came here in 2009 as an exchange student, and um, I was here for a year. I went back to England for a year, and then I ended up coming back here to work for a local newspaper called the Guadalajara Reporter. It's a small English language newspaper for the um, Canadian and American expats who live in Lake Chapala, just south of Guadalajara. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years and then I started freelancing, um, first with Al Jazeera and, and The Independent in England. And then since then I've been working a bit with uh, Vice and The Guardian and a few other outlets. Um, so I cover quite a broad mix of uh, current affairs, crime, politics, human rights, um, some sport business, even food stories, like a, a bit of everything really. Um, <laughs> But uh, today I'll be foc focusing mainly on Mexican politics, uh, corruption, the war on drugs, and uh, the media and what it's like to be a journalist here, and of course, uh, Donald Trump. Um, after, if you have any questions about any of these topics or anything else that I cover, then uh, feel free to ask away. Um, so when we talk about Mexican politics, I think it's important to recognize that in many ways, Mexico is only a very young democracy. It was... It had seven decades of one party rule up until the year 2000. So it's only really been a, a truly democratic country since the turn of the century. Um, so when uh, Vicente Fox of the National Action Party, he was the first president to defeat the, the Institutional Revolutionary Party in 2000 after they'd been in power for 71 years. Um, so many people then thought that Mexico had made its final transition into democracy almost 200 years after the War of Independence with Spain and almost 100 years after the Mexican Revolution. Um, so this was a hugely important moment in uh, Mexican history. But the, the National Action Party, or the, the PAN, they only managed to hold on to power for 12 years. And then uh, the PRI returned again in 2012. So it feels like Mexico's experiment in, in democracy has kind of gone backwards in the last few years because they've gone back to this party that dominated and ruled them in an authoritarian manner for much of the last century. So um, some people believe that there was voting fraud in the 2012 election, and uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if that did happen on some level, but I, I don't think it happened on a large enough scale to directly af out affect the outcome of the presidential election because uh, Enrique Peña Nieto ended up uh, winning by over 3 million votes. So the fact is that after 12 years, millions of Mexicans voted for his party again. And despite all the, the past atrocities that this party was uh, responsible for, like in uh, 1968 in Mexico City, in Tlatelolco, they massacred a square full of student demonstrators. Um, there was other violence in, in 2006 in the state of Mexico when Enrique Peña Nieto, the current president, was a uh, governor at the time. And in, in spite of all these things, he still managed to, to win the election. So I think um, if people decided to vote for them, knowing how, how corrupt and authoritarian this party can be, I think that's a, a kind of demonstration of how weak the opposition is here in Mexico, because the, the PAN and the, the PRD, which is the kind of leftist opposition party, they've failed to, to provide voters with a, a credible alternative to this party. So I think they have to take a lot of the blame for, uh, for what's happening in Mexico as well, not just the, the ruling party. And I think if we look at uh, Vicente Fox in particular, this, this president who, who made history in 2000 by, by um, beating the PRI, I think he had a, a fantastic opportunity to really change Mexico and, and make it a more democratic country. But um, if he'd been really focused and alert, then I think he could have used the, the momentum and the, the democratic mandate that he had to transform Mexico's weak, weak and uh, deeply flawed institutions and begin to build a fairer and less corrupt political system. But I, I think Fox really wasted this opportunity. He didn't manage to pass many significant reforms during his term. And he did have a lot of opposition from Congress, but even so, he never really seemed to, to even try to take advantage of this historic opportunity that he had to, to genuinely transform Mexican politics. Then in the 2006 election, you had Felipe Calderón of the PAN against López Obrador of the, the leftist PRD. This time it looked like it was going to be the, the PRD's chance to govern Mexico for the first time, as uh, López Obrador had a strong lead in the polls. But the PAN began a kind of uh, scare campaign portraying López Obrador as a danger to Mexico. They said that he was a radical leftist like Hugo Chávez in Venezuela, which I don't think was, was quite true. I think he was actually more of a moderate leftist than, than Chávez. 
But um, Calderon's campaign succeeded in transforming public opinion, and he managed to overtake López Obrador and won by just 0.58% of the vote. Again, there were some accusations of voting fraud, and uh, López Obrador held these massive demonstrations in Avenida Reforma, the, the main avenue in Mexico City, and um, he even had himself inaugurated as the legitimate president of Mexico, in his words. And I think it's kind of understandable his reaction because there's a chance that maybe he was the legitimate winner and he just had the presidency stolen from him. But at this point, I think his ego really took over and he began to put himself ahead of his party's chances in the future. And a lot of voters are still disillusioned by what he did, these months of really disruptive protests. And he did uh, begin to lose a lot of popularity after that. He ran again in the next election and he came second, but he lost by a, a wider margin this time. Sorry? Yeah, no, I, I think he is going to run again. In fact, he's already said that he's going to run again. He's now got a new party called Morena. Um, and, uh, but I think like if, if he hadn't taken such a kind of disruptive stance, he could have been a bit smarter politically and regrouped and led a more effective opposition throughout Calderon's presidency. But instead, he began to become a bit irrelevant. But um, he is going to run again in, in 2018. And at, at first, I, I thought this was a mistake because if he's already lost two elections, he's probably not going to win again. But at the moment, um, with everything that's happened in the last year of Brexit and Trump and everything, then you never know what could happen in, in global politics. Maybe it'll be third time lucky for him. Um, yeah. So going back to 2012, the, the pan actually did even worse than the PRD. It fell into third place this time. And that was largely due to Felipe Calderon's highly unpopular war on organized crime when he was president. Um, there's been some suggestion that the reason why Calderon um, declared war on, on the drug cartels as soon as he took office in 2006 was because he wanted to win back a bit of uh, credibility and legitimacy and make the public uh, forget about what a small democratic mandate he had after his very narrow uh, victory in the election. But um, the war on drugs soon became the defining policy of the Calderon administration, and it's, it's what he's mainly remembered for. Um, what he did was to send the military onto the streets to fight organized crime, which is something that in most countries would be considered police work rather than a military operation. Um, his reasoning was that, for one thing, the cartels represented such a serious threat to public security that the military was needed to restore order. And secondly, that the, the army and the navy are considered to be less uh, corruptible than Mexico's police, which have been heavily infiltrated by the cartels in many areas. But one of the major problems with this plan is that the military isn't trained to carry out police work, and this resulted in a lot of human rights abuses being carried out by Mexican soldiers, the vast majority of which have gone unpunished. Another flaw in the government's policy was its uh, kingpin strategy, which is focusing on killing or capturing the, the leaders of every cartel. Um, they did succeed in bringing down a lot of these guys, but this simply caused the violence to, to rise because every time you bring down one leader, then you get four or five of his lieutenants all fighting to take his place, or you get rival cartels moving in to try and challenge their territory. So it just creates a more fragmented uh, map and a more just a kind of endless cycle of violence, really. Um, so, that, yeah, this just... It may weaken the cartels to some extent, but you're never going to stop them from trafficking drugs and from killing people. And uh, Calderon's legacy was over 100,000 Mexicans were either killed or disappeared during his six-year term. And uh, that led the public to feeling so disillusioned with his party that they turned back to the PRI and elected uh, Enrique Peña Nieto in 2012. At first, Peña Nieto said that he was going to adopt a new strategy and focus less on bringing down these kingpins and more on reducing the level of violence that affects the average Mexican. But we haven't really seen any evidence of that. Um, in fact, he's actually been more successful than Calderon in bringing down the big cartel leaders like El Chapo. But um, the level of violence, it did go down at first when he took over, but it's now beginning to rise again. And he's actually on course to end his term with an uh, even higher number of murders than uh, under Calderon. So he basically just continued his predecessor's policies in the war on drugs while spending vast amounts of money on publicity in, a, in an attempt to uh, convince the, the world that this wasn't a problem anymore. This worked for the first year or two of his administration um, with a lot of foreign media outlets like Time magazine famously put him on their, their front cover with the title Saving Mexico. 
because of this, these economic reforms that he was passing. But um, the case that really destroyed this, this narrative that his administration was uh, trying to promote was uh, Ayotzinapa, when uh, 43 student teachers were abducted and most likely massacred in the southern state of Guerrero in September 2014. Um, the local mayor was supposedly involved and the local police force are believed to have abducted these uh, students and handed them over to a cartel. Um, and it was never really clear what happened after that. The government lied repeatedly to the, the parents of these um, children about what happened to them. I spoke to several of the, the parents and their, their pain is just terrible because they've been constantly lied to and they don't even know if their children are alive or not. There was never any conclusive evidence over that. So they can't even kind of uh, begin the grieving process because a lot of them still held out hope that their children might be alive somewhere. And um, the government's unprofessional and unsympathetic management of this case really damaged Peña Nieto's image, both in Mexico and abroad. And the involvement of state security forces in the disappearance of the students also sparked some debate over the role that the US government plays in the drug war. Because the White House provides billions of dollars worth of funding each year for the same security forces that are responsible for many of these human rights abuses. They're also responsible for arming them in many cases. Um, the US obviously plays a major role in the drug war, given that it's the world's largest consumer of illegal drugs and the supplier of a significant number of the firearms that are used in Mexico. But we've also begun to see the US play a, a slightly more progressive and positive role thanks to the, the democratic legalization of marijuana in a number of states in the US. I think this will eventually happen all across the United States. And that would inevitably lead to legalization here in Mexico, because it would make no sense for the Mexican government to continue committing so many lives and resources to fighting the trafficking of a product that's now legal in much of the US. But um, one of the problems is that it's more common for politicians to wait until they've left office before they speak out about drug policy. Like Vicente Fox, when he was in office, he did nothing about it. And now since he left office, he's become a big advocate of uh, the legalization of marijuana. Um, personally, I don't think that legalizing marijuana would stop the cartels overnight because they were just turned, well, they were already beginning to turn to a harder drugs as well, like marijuana, like um, heroin and methamphetamines. But it would be a positive first step towards a more humane and intelligent drug policy. Um, the truth is that there's no easy way to put an end to organized crime and the drug related violence in Mexico. But I believe that the, the best way to start would be for the government to fight the root causes by combating corruption and working to improve education and to eradicate poverty. I don't believe any, any child grows up wanting to be a criminal or a sadistic murderer who cuts people's heads off or dissolves bodies in, in barrels of acid. Uh, that kind of inhumane behavior is the product of the environment in which they're raised and a reflection of the, the lack of education and, and uh, employment opportunities and the sheer desperateness of their economic situation. Um, I think generally, if people, if you give them an opportunity to learn and, and develop as a person, make an honest living that enables them to live a comfortable life, then they're simply not going to resort to selling drugs or taking part in these uh, violent acts. I was in um, Monterrey just a couple of weeks ago, Mexico's third biggest city, working on a story about a non-governmental organization, which is comprised of former street gang members. And they're helping young kids to, who, are, who are kind of caught up in this, this gang life. They're helping them to, to leave it and to go back to school or to find educational opportunities. And um, I spoke to a lot of current and, and former gang members while I was there. And some of these guys look absolutely terrifying with uh, tattoos all over their faces and Santa Muerte chains, like Mexico's kind of death coat uh, hanging from their neck. But um, once you speak to them, some of them were lo lovely people and... Uh, it's, it's amazing the, the impact that just someone taking an interest in their lives can have on them. Um, so I, I think this, this organization has been doing really fantastic work and it just goes to show that all, of these, all these people need sometimes is just someone to believe in them and support them and give them uh, another opportunity in life. So I'd really like to see the Mexican government begin to prioritize issues like poverty and education and wealth inequality in order to prevent uh, future generations of, of young people from joining gangs. Um, unfortunately, the Peña Nieto administration does not seem to have much of an interest in these issues. I think the, his, his party, the PRI, is actually quite unusual compared to other authoritarian governments that we've seen across Latin America throughout the last century, because it's, it's not really a very ideological party at all. It's not kind of left-wing or right-wing in the traditional sense. 
although you could describe some of their more recent uh, reforms as quite neoliberal. But um, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems in Mexican politics, and this, this includes not just the PRI, but the PAN and the PRD, and especially the Green Party as well, which isn't green in any way. Um, the biggest problem with them is the, the, the level of corruption. And this was illustrated by the, the Casablanca scandal in 2014, when it was revealed that um, the president and his wife had obtained a luxury mansion from a prominent government contractor whom they'd awarded concessions worth hundreds of millions of dollars throughout Peña Nieto's time as governor of the state of Mexico and then as president. Um, it later emerged that several of Peña Nieto's cabinet members had also received luxury man mansions from government contractors. And it just makes you think, imagine what would have happened if, if Barack Obama had done the same thing in the United States. The Republicans would have impeached him or forced him to resign immediately. But in, in Mexico, the opposition st stayed pretty silent. They didn't really pressure him much. And it just goes to show again how weak the, the democracy is here and the, the level of accountability. There's a bit virtually zero here. So all that happened is that Peña Nieto eventually appointed a close friend of his to investigate whether there was any conflict of interest. And uh, unsurprisingly, he found that the president was innocent. So no politicians were ever punished for this. But within a couple of months, uh, Carmen Aristegui, one of Mexico's most f famous and respected journalists, and her entire team of investigative reporters were fired because they were the ones that broke the story. Um, I spoke to her, several members of her team, and they're convinced that the, the government pressured her radio show into firing them so as to kind of send a message to reporters about what happens if they cause trouble for the government here. And uh, obviously, as a journalist, I find this very troubling because the traditional role of the media in any democracy is to act as a, a watchdog and expose any wrongdoing by the government. And uh, obviously, with what's going on with Donald Trump in the US at the moment as well, we're going to see very similar tensions or, or we're already beginning to see similar tensions there. So the Peña Nieto administration is spending record amounts of money on advertising so that it can control the media in Mexico. They've spent more than any previous government in history. Um, they give newspapers and TV networks vast amounts of money so that they become completely dependent on the government. So that then if they publish anything criticizing Peña Nieto, then they can threaten to take this money away. So now there's very few media outlets in Mexico that will actually directly criticize the government with Aristegui and Proceso being a couple of examples of the, the more truly independent media here. Um, the submissive nature of parts of the Mexican media was demonstrated last year when Bloomsburg published an interview with a hacker from Colombia who admitted that he'd been hired to manipulate elections all across Latin America over the last 10 years. He said that his biggest job came during the 2012 election here in Mexico when he was paid $600,000 by the Peña Nieto campaign to carry out acts of uh, digital espionage against his rivals López Obrador and, and Josefina Vázquez Mota of the PAN. He said that he hacked all of their, television, their telephone and email communications so that Peña Nieto's team knew everything that his rivals were doing at any given time. He also helped to sabotage Enrique Alfaro's campaign here in Jalisco to stop him becoming the governor. And I think, again, if, if this had happened in the US or in Europe or in any more robust democracy, then it would, would have been the biggest story of the year and it would have created a major scandal that would most likely cause the president to resign. It's almost like a, a modern digital version of the Watergate scandal that led to President Nixon in the US resigning in the 1970s. But again, here in Mexico, there was very little discussion of this story in the media, and it was basically forgotten after a couple of days. So you have to conclude that the media here is not doing its job, and that's at least partly because of the level of control that the Mexican government has over the media. Another important factor in the political corruption in Mexico is that of uh, money laundering. Um, about a year ago, I interviewed Edgardo Buscaglia, a professor at Columbia University in New York and one of the le world's leading experts on organized crime. And he told me that the amount of money generated through political corruption in Mexico, including tax evasion, bribery, misuse of public funds and influence peddling, is actually more than uh, even the, the vast sums of money generated by drug trafficking. So you're talking billions of dollars every year. Buscaglia also told me that it's very common for political campaigns to be funded by uh, drug money, meaning that certain cartels have a strong influence over politicians at local, state and even sometimes federal level. So I think there really needs to be more regulation of campaign finances in Mexico and there needs to be a completely autonomous investigative body that can uh, investigate and punish cases of political corruption and money laundering without being influenced by the government.
Um, like I said, I think all of Mexico's main parties are guilty of corruption, but there have been some more positive developments, especially here in Jalisco in the last couple of years. If you look at the, the election of Pedro Kumamoto yeah. and uh, the success of the citizens' movement a couple of years ago in the state election, well, the local elections. I'm sure there is some level of uh, corruption within some of these places like the, the citizens' movement, but I do think they deserve the opportunity to demonstrate that they can do things differently from the, the PAN or the PRI. For example, when the, the current mayor of Guadalajara, <coughs> Enrique Alfaro, he was mayor of Tlajamulco, a small town on the edge of the city, and he transformed it into the most transparent municipal government in Mexico, according to an annual study by a Mexican NGO. Um, he introduced some interesting policies like the participatory budget, which allows citizens to vote on what some of their taxes are spent on, and the revocación de mandato, which is um, it's a tool that gives citizens the power to call new elections in the middle of his term if they're not happy with his performance. And uh, Alfaro has now begun to introduce the same measures in Guadalajara now that he's mayor here. And there has been some criticism of his administration, but I think he's at least trying to be more transparent and progressive than most of his predecessors. Uh, I've interviewed Alfaro a couple of times and maybe I wouldn't trust him completely, but I do think that him and his Citizens Movement Party are a more positive alternative to the PRI or the PAN, who had governed Guadalajara for over 100 years before he won. And I think he'll probably win the Jalisco state governorship next year, so it'll be interesting to see what happens then. Um, another of the most exciting and encouraging recent developments in Mexican politics has been the emergence of independent candidates. Um, the two 2015 elections were the first time that independent candidates were allowed to run for office in Mexico, and there were some very notice notable successes. The most obvious example was that of the victory of Jaime Rodriguez, or El Bronco, who became Mexico's first ever independent governor in the northern state of Nuevo León. Um, he's already said that he's considering running for president next year, but I, I'm, I'm not convinced that he's got enough support at national level or that he'd really be that different to a pre-candidate if he were to win, because he actually was in the pre for like 30 years before he became an independent. But um, he's quite charismatic and he uses a lot of Mexican slang and swear words in his speeches. And that kind of creates the impression that he's different to the average politician. And again, as we've seen with Trump, then these kind of anti-establishment candidates can win a huge amount of support that way. But um, he only turned independent as a last resort because the PRI didn't nominate him as their candidate in the election. So I'm still pretty skeptical about whether he'd really um, be much different to the PRI if he was to, to take power. But um, what he did prove is that independent candidates can beat major parties at state level. And that's a, a pretty important example for everyone in Mexican politics to take note of. Um, the one independent candidate who has really impressed me is, is Kumamoto, who became the first ever independent to win a seat in the Jalisco State Congress two years ago. Um, I've met him a few times. He's only just turned 27 last week. But I think he's a, he's a pretty ma mature and intelligent guy. And the important thing about his candidacy is that it's not just centered around him. He represents Wikipolitica, which is a grassroots political movement that sprung up here in Jalisco a couple of years ago. And their main focus is to increase transparency and civic participation in politics. And they've gradually been spreading to different states across Mexico. So I think they could uh, eventually build quite a strong political movement in the future. Kumamoto only had a, a tiny budget and uh, his campaign was entirely built on knocking on doors and speaking to his neighbors and gradually building up a bigger profile through word of mouth. No one expected him to win. But he did, and I think it shows that the voters are completely fed up with the, the politics of old. And they're much more open to new ideas than many people realize. I think the same kind of thing happened with uh, Bernie Sanders in the US last year. No one would have really imagined that that many Americans would support a socialist candidate, given America's political history. But um, despite the media and the political establishment trying to ignore him, we saw that once citizens started going to vote in the primaries, it was clear that millions of people actually were genuinely supportive of what he was doing and excited about what he stood for. I lost my page now. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so maybe as well, if it wasn't for the the Democrat Party's superdelegates all supporting Hillary Clinton from the outset, then perhaps Sanders could even have won the nomination and then maybe even gone on to beat Donald Trump. But uh, we'll never know. 
But uh, going back to Kumamoto, I think unlike uh, El Bronco in, in Nuevo León, I, th I think he is genuinely different. And for one thing, he's donating 70% of his salary to fund community projects in his district. Um, he's helped to pass a law that strips public officials in Jalisco of their immunity to prosecution. Up until now, they've been immune to prosecution while they're in office. Um, and right now, he's working on another initiative to reduce the public funding of political parties in Mexico, which has already been approved unanimously by the state Congress. And he's now taking it to the federal Congress and hopes to pass that in the next few weeks. But um, when we talk about Mexico's political system, what we're talking about is a representative democracy where citizens elect politicians to represent their interests in government. But one of the problems with this system of representative democracy is that you can't really trust the, polit the politicians to defend your interests or uphold the values that they say they stand for. Because in many cases, the politicians are really just defending their own interests or those of powerful corporations or even criminal organizations. So I think it's great that people like uh, Kumamoto and Alfaro are at least trying to create more trust by enhancing accountability and involving citizens in the political process. And, um, but there are, there are some alternatives to representative democracy that have also worked on a very small scale in some rural Mexican communities. The most obvious example being the participatory democracy favored by the indigenous Zapatista movement in the southern state of Chiapas. Um, if you're not familiar with the Zapatista movement, they are an indigenous group that led an armed uprising on January 1st, uh, 1994, the same day that the North American Free Trade Agreement came into effect, because it, it um, under the negotiations, the Mexican government basically gave away the right to the communal land that these indigenous Mexicans had uh, controlled for generations. And uh, that was one of the major one of the most uh, biggest gains that they'd fought and, and died for during the Mexican Revolution. So the Zapatistas rose up in arms and briefly controlled a few cities in, in Chiapas, but they were, they were poorly armed and they were soon forced back into the mountains and the jungles, where they still live in complete autonomy to this day. Um, they're now essentially a non-violent movement, although they're, they're still the victims of the regular provocation and intimidation by the Mexican military and government-backed paramilitary groups. When I first came to Mexico, I spent a couple of weeks living in a Zapatista community to research my thesis on their autonomous education system. And um, one of the things that I found interesting there was this model of participatory democracy that they have. Basically, each of their communities is run by a council of about five people known as the Junta de Buen Gobierno. And the members of this council rotate every couple of weeks so that everyone in the community gets their turn at helping to, to govern, and everyone is actively uh, involved in democracy and decision-making. Um, of course, no political system is perfect, and the main problem with this Zapatista model is that it can make decision-making a very slow process, because virtually the whole community has to be in favour of any action in order for it to be approved by the council. But the main benefits are that there are no corrupt career politicians who claim to be representing the people and there are no decisions made against the collective will of the people. So I thought that was quite encouraging and it would be interesting to see other indigenous communities adopt similar models of democracy ag across Mexico, given that indigenous groups are typically the poorest and the most marginalized and the most discriminated against in all of Mexico. Um, now the biggest issue facing Mexico today is obviously the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, as you all know, Trump has threatened auto manufacturers to bring jobs in Mexico back to the United States. He wants to scrap or renegotiate NAFTA. He's threatened to round up and deport millions of undocumented migrants. And he's repeatedly said that he's going to build this border wall and make Mexico pay for it. So this has led Mexico's president Enrique Peña Nieto to canceling a planned visit to the White House last week. And uh, when they spoke on the phone a few days later, Trump reportedly even threatened to send American soldiers into Mexico to, to deal with the cartels because he said the, the Mexico, Mexico's army wasn't capable. Uh, the White House later claimed that this was an offer to help rather than a threat, but it did sound alarmingly like a threat to invade Mexico. Um, so Trump seems determined to start a trade war and to destroy the Mexican economy. And every time that he tweets about Mexico, it causes the, the peso to decline against the dollar. It's now at its worst rate against the dollar in decades. Um, but he doesn't seem to realize that this is pretty counterproductive, even from his point of view, because the further the peso drops in value, the more attractive a place Mexico becomes to uh, American investors. 
And uh, this added value that they get for every, every dollar they spend here could actually outweigh any additional taxes that Trump imposes on imports from Mexico. Um, another thing is that if, if Trump does succeed in ruining Mexico's economy, that's only going to drive more Mexicans to immigrate uh, illegally to the United States in search of work because there won't be any more opportunities here. So if, if Trump seriously wanted to reduce illegal immigration, then he'd be better off working constructively with Mexico to create a healthy economy on both sides of the border so that there would be less incentive for people here to leave. His plans for the wall are also pretty ludicrous because there's already a heavily militarized fence that covers about half of the border. Um, the majority of drugs are smuggled through legal border crossings. And as long as there's money to be made, then drug traffickers and human traffickers will always find a way to get across, whether that's by air or by sea or through tunnels. Um, so Mexico really needs strong leadership to defend it from this hostile and unpredictable Trump administration. But the public have no faith in Peña Nieto to do that right now. Um, I'm surprised that he hasn't taken a stronger, more nationalist stance against Trump, because this would have been quite an easy way to unite the country and boost his, his low popularity ratings. He's, he's currently got approval ratings of just 12%, which are the worst in history for a Mexican president. But um, instead of taking this, what would have been a fairly easy nationalist stance to take, he's just been incredibly meek and doesn't seem to have much of a plan at all. So, um, but th there are several measures that Mexico could take to, to um, or at least threaten to take to, during negotiations to, to try to get the US to back off. Um, for one thing, it could relax security on its southern border. At the moment, the US pressures and funds Mexico into having a very strict border control on, on the southern border with Guatemala in order to stop um, migration from Central America. The vast majority of illegal immigrants who are moving into the US at the moment are actually from Central America, where they're trying to escape from uh, pretty horrific gang-related violence. And in Honduras, there was a, a military coup backed by Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State in 2009, I think, which has caused chaos and a very rep repressive uh, military government there. So it's actually partly the consequence of US actions that are um, fueling some of this migration as well. But um, Mexico could stop cooperating and, and just let these, South, these uh, Central American migrants through and let them have a free shot at the US border. Um, they could also end co cooperation with the US in the war on drugs and expel America's DEA agents from their country. But I'm not convinced that this would be the most productive or intelligent strategy, but these are some of the things that have been kind of floated in the Mexican media as possible measures. Um, another more kind of grassroots thing that people have started doing is a, a campaign to stop or to boycott American businesses like Walmart and McDonald's and Starbucks and uh, focus on consuming Mexican-made products, which seems like a fairly sensible and, and healthy uh, plan. Um, and one thing Mexico could try to do is to delay any negotiations with Donald Trump because there's a pretty good chance that he might be impeached in the next year or two, given the, the many conflicts of interest he's got and the fact that even a Republican party, I don't think really support him because they can't really control him and he's, he's not a traditional Republican. So I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he doesn't see out his, his um, full term. So if, uh, if Mexico could delay those negotiations, then he might end up negotiating with a, a less hostile president. Uh, the Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim, who was the, the world's richest man a couple of years ago, He's also announced that he's uh, willing to help the government negotiate with Trump. And this might be of some help because he's considered the only Mexican that Trump actually fears and respects, purely because he's got more money than Trump. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's been some speculation that Slim might run for president in Mexico next year. But I don't think that's what the country needs, really. Um, wealth inequality, as we saw in the US, it's also a massive problem here in Mexico. It's one of the, the biggest problems facing Mexico today, in my opinion. You've got about 50% of the population living in poverty, while the vast majority of wealth is uh, concentrated in the hands of a few individuals and uh, led by Carlos Slim. So I don't really think that putting Slim in, in charge would help Mexico to save this problem, uh, to solve this problem or to move forward as a country. Um, he did actually deny the speculation that he's preparing to run for president during a recent press conference. But um, if the last year has taught us anything, then it's to, to expect the unexpected. And at this stage, I don't think there's anything that would truly surprise me when it comes to the future of uh, Mexican or even global politics.